we'll have a wide variety of, of topics here today. We've actually got, um, it says in the program, four presenters, but we've got a fifth one who's from Tanzania who had missed this visa thing on Monday, so he'll be with us. Um, as a surprise guest. But otherwise, we have until 10.30, so plenty of time. My name is Elizabeth von Rich. I'm from Germany. I work um, as a freelancer for the Sustainable Sanitation Alliance. And um, I might as well make a plug here for my big passion, which is the Susanna Discussion Forum, an online discussion forum with 4,500 members. And any of you is very welcome to join it, to use it. If you have any discussions that come out of today which you want to continue outside past this room, then I welcome you to use the forum and also for the presenters, they can put their presentation up there and we can take it to a much wider audience than just these hundred or so people who are in this room. So, the first presenter is Jenna Senekal. She's a PhD student from the Swedish University of Agricultural Science originally from Canada, I found out. Background is in bioresource engineering, focusing on converting waste. And she, she's um, specializing in the design of waste management systems that optimize packaging removal and enhance nutrient removal. Okay, we've got 12 minutes. Thank you for the introduction. <coughs> So we know that there's 7 billion of us defecating every single day. And that unfortunately, there's 1.2 billion people still defecating in the open. But what really disappoints me is that there's still actually 4.1 billion people who don't have access to post-treatment after defecating. We've learned a lot over the last two days as to how this is impacting at children, the spread of disease, and also impacting the environment. As much as this is a problem, I also like to see this as an opportunity to rethink how we handle our waste. The, our excreta contains the same nutrients that are being used by plant fertilizer. So if we efficiently recycle our waste back into our agricultural system, not only can we decrease our dependency on synthetic fertilizer, but we can also increase our uh, or improve our soil structure with their organic content. A very great concept, but obviously not being used for several reasons. A lot of challenges have been highlighted. One of them is just the aspirations of wanting a flush toilet and this concept that a dry toilet smells and that it's not as appealing. Another issue is the concept of using our own excreta as a fertilizer for food. There's a natural uh, disgust to our excreta, and why would we want to then eat food that was grown with it? A really big challenge, though, is just the sheer mass of excreta that you have to handle. And that's why I'm here today. For my master's study, I was growing vegetables with urine to actually verify how well urine works as a fertilizer. And though I was able to demonstrate that there's no significant difference in the mass of production between urine fertilizer and synthetic fertilizer, the amount of work that it took to collect all this urine and then carry it to my plot and apply it, inevitably I spilled it all over myself. And people had to excuse themselves nicely out of my presence as they were gagging from the smell as I was collecting urine and trying to spread it. So after my master's study, I was like, no way is this ever going to actually be accepted worldwide, and this doesn't make sense. So now I'm with the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences to try to design a toilet that efficiently recirculates the nutrients, but that is actually practical. So the objective for my toilet is that it's an in-situ treatment where the waste is actually minimized on-site within the toilet, and that the final output are a dry fertilizer from the urine that has a commercial value, 
and a Titanic soil amendment. I don't want to change how users actually interact with the toilet, but what happens afterwards. So the urine is diverted away from the feces during an excretion, and then each is contained, treated, and condensed on site. The urine poses a special problem in that the nitrogen is quickly hydrolyzed to ammonia, which is volatile. And so it's hard to preserve the nitrogen, but that's the most demanded fertilizer in the world. And so that's what I wanted to focus on. So to do this, we propose an alkaline treatment followed by dehydration. The alkaline treatment works with an ion exchanger where we exchange the chlorides out for hydroxide, and this is able to increase the pH from less than 7 to above 10. And what this does is it inhibits the urease enzymes, which are responsible for hydrolysizing the urea to ammonia. So if we're able to lift <coughs> these enzymes, then we can actually dehydrate the urine afterwards. So with our urine at a high pH and still low concentration, we have the next problem of trying to dehydrate the urine. You can't just simply let it evaporate because the layer forms on the top and then the water can't get through this bad layer. So what we do is we mix it in with ash to break up the surface and maintain it at a 35 degree temperature for fans. And it was really exciting because we were able to output a pretty high quality fertilizer. We had a 9311 nitrogen phosphate potassium dry fertilizer. So there's no liquid disposal and no odors. And we were able to decrease the mass by 90%. And during that time, we were able to recuperate over 85% of the nitrogen. Pretty cool. The feces, as we know, poses quite a big challenge with the pathogens contained in it. And so we're looking into vermicomposting. The feces would fall directly into a bin with worms so that within the container, the mass can be reduced by up to 90%. There's already a lot of other improvements that are being with this concept, which is also very exciting. But the problem is the mature compost still poses a threat as it can still contain pathogens. So we would like to use ammonia sanitization in order as a post-treatment to ensure that all pathogens are eliminated. Ammonia sanitization is a technique that my colleague Anne Van Rutten has been explaining in the past or uh, yesterday. And by mixing in 5% weight for weight of our dry fertilizer that we have, the remaining pathogens and enzymes still in the soil in the vermicomposted material, those enzymes then hydrolyze the urea into ammonia, and then we're able to sanitize this to get a hygienic output. Conceptually, this is how the toilet would come together. There's no need for big infrastructure or for deep holes. It can be a standalone unit itself or be implemented in existing households. The idea is that the urine diverting seed would collect the urine and the urine would pass directly through the ion exchanger so that there's no time for the hydrolysis to happen and then pass it into the dehydration module. And again, the feces will fall down directly into the vermicomposting bin. This unit would be connected to a powerful fan so that we have enough evaporation rate happening and be connected to the toilet so that the smell is, uh, there's a negative pressure so that the smell is taken out. For maintenance, the ion exchanger for family five would need to be regenerated once a week and this is done with some hydroxide solutions such as sodium hydroxide. The dehydration module would be needed at changing every two months, and the vermin composting would need to be changed once a year. The estimated cost for the materials to maintain this toilet is estimated to be about $30 per year. Coming back to what this toilet is actually able to achieve, for the urine, we have about 1,800 kilograms coming in annually for a family of five, and we're able to reduce this to 180 kilograms to produce a dry fertilizer with 
while recuperating 85% of the nitrogen. For the feces, we have approximately 330 kilograms, which we're able to reduce to 35 kilograms, with the, including the uh, dry fertilizer being added to it to, for the ammonia and sanitization. So the exciting part is that we don't need a, a pump truck. We don't need big machinery to dig holes or to get in and empty it. The mass is reduced by 90% into manageable uh, volumes that people can then handle. And a really important aspect is that the pathogens are minimized so that we don't have the spread of disease. Next, for my thesis work, I'll be testing the alkaline and dehydration module in series, and also be looking at the fate of pathogens in the end product. And this summer, we will be installing two of these units in Sweden as a trial period. As we're still in the development phase of this, I'm very much looking forward to hearing your comments and thoughts, and thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, this is very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, my, my uh, I'm Nina from Indonesia. My question is that uh, how does the diseases are from the people who get sick before? And second is that what kind of the uh, agriculture or, or uh, plant can be used for It has a, a safety factor on it, so we can accept a 
few extra liters of water and won't impact the system. For the vermin composting, worms are quite sensitive to ammonia, so if we do have urine going into that system, then it could uh, impact it. So the idea is to have enough uh, buffering material within the system already, so that the worms, one, have space to get away from it, but also that it's minimized. We have time for one more question. Yes. Hey. I uh, take from NC State. I'm just curious if there have been any studies into how the users feel about having worms in their toilet and then turn it off. Yeah, students saying no problem. I think um, definitely some people would not want it based on talking to some colleagues at home. Um, so it's definitely something that might have to be overcome, but I think there are definitely lots of examples happening around the world now where people are accepting it. But yeah, good question. Okay, so then we'll stop here with the questions and let's see if you can use the another discussion forum for more discussion.
Those circuits now move our relationships. These are all emotions. So I didn't know about emotions either. Um, so I read a book. Uh, the design student recommended to me, which was the classic book apparently on uh, design. Uh, it's emotional design, why we love or hate everyday things. And in this book, it, it explains that we actually operate on three different levels in our decision making. The reflective decision, the reflective level, the behavioural level, and the visual level. And actually, these are all interconnected, so they can influence each other. So, at the basic level, this is the visual level. Uh, this is hardwired into all of us. It's the, I'm being attacked, I have to run away. You don't have time to think about this one, you run. It goes back apparently to, to the days when uh, if you didn't run quick enough or fast enough, you were eaten. So it, it goes across all the cultures. It isn't just, oh, I don't work like that in Africa. Very much to sight, sound, touch and smell. It's often irrational. So the sort of things that create this visceral reaction are things like rats. And we all think things like this is going to happen. Completely irrational, but... <laughs> Being scared of heights is very common. Anybody who is not scared of heights, die. If you are scared of heights, it's a built-in protection. Then we get more into this sort of... <laughs> These are they generate this feeling of disgust. <laughs> because disgusting things are generally speaking dangerous and pathogenic. So we will learn to keep our way away from these things. <laughs> it's very easy to get this reaction. Okay? That's disgusting in any culture you could. Okay? So is that. So is that. Okay? And when you go into a toilet and you see shit like that inside the hall, that's disgusting. No culture in the world will think that's a nice thing to see. So when we're looking at visual design, what do we have to consider as the tree design? First of all, the, 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 the smell of the shit, the sight of the shit, the heat of the shit. Okay? These are all things that have this negative visual reaction. Flies, insects, rats. Deep room pits, um, and dark, miserable compartments. These are all things that we're naturally uh, responsive and opposed to, 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 to these sorts of stimulation. So, what does that mean we have to do? No smell. Uh, in Africa, they often refer that to you take a top off, a wuss come out from the latrine, and they call that the heat. So, the heat is often very much associated with disease as well. Uh, no sight, uh, light, bright areas, uh, no insects, flies, cockroaches, no deep looming pits that you thought you were going to fall down. Particularly when your brother's told you the big monster lives down the pit. Uh, don't go in there if it's all dark. I mean, would you use a tree in those circumstances? Uh, no bouncing claws, because you might fall through. Um, Missing the squat hole is also very common. So you've got to be able to find your way there quite easily and well ventilated. These are the fundamental things that we really need to be designing. And what do we do? Concrete slabs. Hey, brilliant. That's our solution. Concrete slabs remove none of those visceral reactions. They are designed, when I first started doing this, the question, are the design because they're easy to clean and we won't get a scarce on the on the concrete slabs. That's why we do concrete slabs. Not the household's objective, our objective. Then we get on to behavioural design. This is where we feel more comfortable as engineers. Okay? It's all about functional aspects, it's all about use. Uh, appearance doesn't really matter, it's a very rational process. It's the it's actually uh, how they describe it, it's like driving a car. You, sometimes you're driving a car, you could have gone 10 kilometers and how did I get there? You, it's almost instinctive. And then the comfortable things we all feel plans, the ventilation improved, fit the train, the 
Peter Wally develop? <coughs> Technically invented. We're going to get rid of the flies, we're going to fly with it, we're going to fly with the vent pipe, we're going to remove the smell, people are going to shoot in it. What he didn't think about was that to make it work, you have to have a really dark compartment. And if you look at all the VIP things, the first thing people do is make them light.
I will ignore in the visceral and the reflective levels in that design process. The solution designed to all three levels. And if you have a doubt, ask me why. Okay? If you are in touch, you understand this. Uh, we've got the missing pleasure of the time. Uh, just a few examples of how we promote toilets in the West. Uh, in, in the West, we have Andrex with enriched with aloe vera toilet paper. So obviously, you need aloe vera to spread all over your ass. So <laughs> <laughs> promoting lifestyle, promoting self image. This, I came across this advert and what's that for? I have to look twice. There's actually an advert for a toilet. Reflection is tranquility. Um, okay, we show the products. So the only products that we seem to have at the moment that seem to be going really well are things like the platter, which needs the additional design level. And the Jurassic, which we are promoting in the garden. And septic tanks, more than a septic tank, local septic tanks that we develop in the <laughs> And that the Casio is always worth as much as the Rolex. Uh, 
think what happens in practice is that willingness to pay is dynamic. People will pay a lot of other things. So what we're finding in places like Uganda, where it comes to Jura Sands, people can't, they want it, but they can't afford to pay it. So it's the ability to pay. And that's where we have to, and, and in places like Uganda, we're working on microfinance. Now, concrete is very functional, and we're building walls on concrete. What you really want it to look for is that when you open that door, and you look in that for the first time, you say, ah, whatever. So, yes, we can have concrete walls, but covering them with tiles disguises the, the fact that it's concrete. And I think it's important programs to offer the, the, the option of putting tiles onto, onto the wall and personalizing their truth. Okay, there's one more over there. There's one at the back. Which I think is mentioned in the last one. Hi, I'm Esther from Oxford. Um, increasingly, people are more addressing this idea of having an emotion drive behind your products. And then um, one of the things that we was brought up in the keynote on the first day with the idea of scale. Now, as soon as you start looking at motivational drivers and personalization of products, it's very hard to do a large scale program. So, I'm not saying you've got an answer, but do you possibly have some guidance as to how to do a large scale engineered safe product while also bringing in emotional drivers? to a larger scale to bring that product to, to Africa and to other parts of the world. 
but then also helping them to figure out what's the next step, pasta sato, working specifically in plastics and rotor molding. Um, and we're looking at white, so hopefully you'll be pleased with that. We're looking, we've, hopefully in February, we'll be launching a $20 user interface toilet, so that's a like user interface to the entrance of the pit, all in plastics, um, really mass producible and really easy to move around. So be, be looking for that and keep watching. So I'm here to chat with you a little bit about what some of the challenges in Bangladesh. Um, we're talking about to seal or not to seal, that is the question, especially in Bangladesh. And if you get a group of practitioners together, we will fight over this a lot. And so I don't want to discuss that as much. Um, I guess I need a slide, don't I? So we were originally going to talk about simplifying the uh, Bangladesh's latrine pit debate to filter innovation, something that as ID we've been working at through the process of human centered design. I got to spend seven weeks in the field doing research, and this is kind of one of the things that came out of that. Um, but really, after a little bit of uh, extra time, and after a little monsoon, really I'm going to be chatting about lessons about pit infiltration during the monsoon in southern Bangladesh. Um, so a little bit of a change here in my presentation, but hopefully the, the learnings will be just as rich. Uh, I'm with Proofs. Proofs is a, a Nexus project looking at agriculture, nutrition, and, uh, and WASH, implemented by EcoID and BOP Innovation Center and funded by the Dutch. And really quickly, IDE, uh, I work on the WASH and the Technology and Innovation team. You can read that quickly if you want, but it's not as important. So when we talk about Bangladesh, Bangladesh is not in the handbook. I don't know if you've ever read a handbook or a guidebook about sanitation, but if you read the fine print, every single fine print relates to Bangladesh. Don't do this in this situation. Don't do this in this situation. So high groundwater, monsoon flooding, high population density, small land size, extensive shallow groundwater use for drinking, um, and cooking, pond water use extensively. Every single caveat that's written in these guidebooks is directly related to Bangladesh. And so as I began working there, I started scratching my head thinking, oh my goodness, what are we going to do around sanitation? So we started looking around um, specifically around what are we going to do in areas, how can we do a simple solution in areas where people are drinking the water that is extracted from a tube well right next to a tree pit. And so many people will say, well, they should be you know, 30 meters apart. They don't have 30 meters of space. Well, they need a community well. They don't want a community well. No, they already have a tube well on their plant property. So is there a way that we can make a really simple way to, um, to protect the this, um, seepage coming out of the latrine pit and getting into the water? So we looked at looking at sand and below pits which is the WHO recommendation, half meters of sand all the way around a pit. And we combine that, because sand is quite expensive in Bangladesh. It's kind of funny, because it's a country entirely made of sand, but it's actually quite expensive and kind of hard to get good quality sand. And combine that with the composting filter latrine, which uses a bag, I've got some mesh here, you can come and see it if you want later. And we've got the filter, you can just stop with that. Um, the filter latrine, so there's two different varieties of the filter. We'll talk about that in just a moment. This is done a proofs project in southern Bangladesh. We did five test installations and one control pit. Four filter installations, we'll talk about what those four were in just a moment, a moment, and one sand installation. And we did this pilot from May to December of last year. Um, we were prototyping and testing this filter latrine idea in places with high groundwater, with loamy soil, so that's a mixture of sand and clay. Um, and we were looking for bacteria reduction in the infiltration effluent. So we're trying to see if, if does the sand actually work? The WHO recommends the sand. Is there a way we can reduce the amount of sand that's required? And does it actually work for keeping bacteria from getting into the tube well that's quite close by? So, oh, so here's what we did. We did two different types, um, two different amounts of sand. We did, so in installation A, we did 40 centimeters of sand underneath the pit. So the sealed three rings, normal, very you know, traditional Bangladeshi installation. And um, we use the disc of mesh, just like this, which is what the bag, the composting filter bag the train is it's coming out of Germany. And then in um, installation C and D, we use the same amount of sand, and we use the bag, the actual bag. It's a bit more expensive, a lot more sewing. My sewing gal was kind of confused when I came here with all this mesh. She said, please make me sewing bags. Um, but here's what they look like on the ground. So this is installation B. This is, we haven't quite put all of the, um, the rings in in B. But this is where the groundwater level is. This is just normal Bangladesh. Um, and we can raise the pits, but this latrine is already higher than their house. And I tried to raise the pit even higher, and they were kind of angry with me. They're like, we don't want it. We don't want a poop higher than our house. 
which I don't really blame them. So we, we, we met to the lo lowest level that we could. And then so as you see, you can see the bag there. So what happened? This is what it looked like when we finalized them. You can see on the bottom there, the, there's a little plastic bag over a stick. That's our sampling probe. So we have a sampling probe that goes underneath the sand or pulling off liquid effluent to see what, the, what we, what's coming out of the pits. And here's, there's the water. Like I said, not in the handbook. This is where the water is in the location of the trains. This is pretty normal. Um, this is my team and the guy who dug the pit and the, fa the family who will be using the toilet. This is before we got the tin on. So this is what happened. We tested the water that was in the pits when we started and there was contamination. And if you look at installations A, B, C, and D, right through the beginning of the monsoon, we actually had complete removal of bacteria at the bottom of the sand layer. We weren't getting any bacteria coming out. Um, the joke at the DPHE, or the testing facility we were using, we were using a governmental testing facility, they were asking us where our well was because they thought it was really good drinking water, which kind of made me laugh. Didn't tell them where it was actually from. Um, but we, so we were pulling the samples off and they were coming out with zero bacteria count. And I was like, wow, this is actually working quite well. And in the sand installation, you could see the bacteria on the y-axis. We got, you know, some, some count there. And the control pit again. So we were like, okay, great. So it doesn't really matter if you use the bag or the disc. They both seem to be working reasonably well. And you need the, you need the mesh, though. The mesh does help significantly. It helps dewater and helps keep the water out and the solids in. Um, but it's definitely working better than the control. This is just a summarization of that. And then we had the monsoon. And through the monsoon, it was working really well. And we could get there, you know, flooding, we, we sent our guys out to, to take the samples. And then after the monsoon ended, we went back and sampled again. And this is where things get to look, gets a little more complicated. We saw a massive spike in installations in B and D. Now, I, this is probably very, very bad from a technical perspective, but I couldn't do uncountable on the y-axis, so I just made it 1,000. We can talk about my, my methodology, my process in that if you want to at a later time. But, so B and C have had this massive spike. I was like, oh my goodness, what's happening? Because the control pit went down to zero bacteria count. Well, that doesn't work. So I was like, all right, go guys, go back out and sample again. And I went with them to make sure they were sampling correctly. And then we couldn't get any liquid from pits B and D, and we had a spike in A and C. I was like, okay, what is happening? What do we think is going on? And at the same time, our sand spiked to uncountable amounts of bacteria, and our sand or our control remained at zero. So here's what I think is happening. I took these pictures that we were installing. You remember the picture at the beginning where there was that family and uh, my, my team, and there was a lot of water behind the pit? This is that same installation. And we actually were using an existing latrine pit. We pulled up all of the sludge and we dug it out and completely started from scratch as we were putting the new pit in. And if you can see here, it's a little bit maybe a little bit hard to see, but right where the gaps in the rings would be, we saw a very interesting thing happening that I'm calling channeling. And basically, the fecal sludge is channeling, not radially coming out of the pit, but actually channeling through hydraulic connectivity to the nearest water body. Because you remember how close that water was, right? And so this is what we're actually seeing happening. It's at the level where the gaps would be in the rings. Instead of going radially out, we see this channeling happening. So I went back and I was going through my pictures and I found this. I was like, oh my goodness, this is what's happening. I'm going to do a little diagram here and I'll show you. So in our control, remember it's not sealed to control. So as the monsoon came and it flooded, it's the, um, the fecal matter is actually going out, channeling through to the water, and it's not coming down to the bottom of the pit like we would expect it to. And in our filter installations, all four of them, we think what's happening is actually channeling in the sand that's going right next to the, to the test, test sample. So you're not actually getting any um, of the, the benefits of the sand. Like, kind of think about the water filter, like a sand water filter. So as the, the sludge goes down, the, the effluent coming down comes through the sand layer, you get bacterial reduction through different, four different methods. Um, we can talk about that again later. But that wasn't how we don't think that's happening because we actually think the sand is channeling out and you just get a direct um, channel right to the bottom of the pit. So it's, I don't, hopefully this is interesting for you. It was very interesting for me to find these results. So here's what we think. We think that filter pits could work really well. 
in certain systems, certain, certain areas. One of these would be in, in high density population areas where people are using drinking water from a tube well or from a hand pump, but isn't flooding as regularly. So for example, in cities where you don't get the, as much flood water, and in northern Bangladesh where they're really drinking the water right next to the latrine. We tested this in southern Bangladesh where the tube wells are a lot deeper, so if we messed up, no one was gonna get hurt. But if we bring this up to northern Bangladesh, where really it's the tube well, in a nice household, the tube well is supposed to be right next to the toilet, so you have easy access for water to get back and forth. That's the ideal kind of mindset about what's a good home you know, setup. And if we can put these pits in there where you're not getting as much flooding, but you are reducing the connectivity or the bacteria contamination between the tube well and the latrine, it's very simple. Secondly, we really think that sand envelope pits may not be as effective in reducing contamination as it is assumed in literature. Um, and we can, we can tell this by the very basics of if you put sand on the bottom of the pit and it's channeling through the monsoon, then really is that as effective as we think it is? Are there ways to decrease the, the grain size of the sand? Are there ways to keep the sand a bit more condensed to pack it down more so you're not getting the same channeling? And thirdly, our conclusion is we really need to continue to do the research. Um, we're going to figure out if we can stop the channeling in our filter installations and also see if this erratic behavior in the pathogen removal or the bacteria removal stops um, during the dry season. So it's some different things we need to continue to test and we continue to work on. Obviously, this is definitely a work in progress. We haven't you know, sealed this, if you will, and we don't know exactly what we're going to do. But I will just, because I think we have a little bit of extra time, I'll show you the, the mesh really quickly. It's just fingerling mesh. I don't know if any of you guys work in agricultural projects or in agricultural projects. It's just, you know, fishing mesh. And there's three layers here. Um, we sew them together. You don't necessarily have to sew them together. You just put them at the bottom. And um, use, we use brick chips instead of um, gravel because it's really hard to get gravel in Bangladesh. It's very difficult. So just a layer of sand, a layer of gravel or brick chips, and then some of this mesh. And it seems to be working in really very simple way and reducing the amount of sand quite you know, substantially. So, love to see your questions. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Uh, very interesting. First time I've learned about it or seen it. So, trust I did not come out with something new. Very nice. But you said the toilet was wise. That's what we're doing. Yeah, so we're having a toilet coming out in the, uh, in the new year, in February, that'll be white. Um, that'll be a plastic version. Yeah. So we have time for some questions. Over that way, where's the microphone? Not in here. Oh, okay. Don't forget to say who you are. Yes, hi. Uh, my name is Eddie Perez, and uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation. I too am an engineer, but I confess I'm kind of a reformed or failed uh, lapsed engineer. Um, I, 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 having just come from uh, Bangladesh recently, I, I noted that Bangladesh is still one of the poorest countries in the world, with about 60% of the population living in extreme poverty uh, of the dollar 50 a day. So my question is, ballpark, I realize it's early stages, what is the cost of that whole package? And so in terms of how affordable and feasible it is in society. But my real question, my second question, is really I don't really understand the, the goal, is this improving health? Is drinking water from the two wells that has some people in the is that really the highest risk that those families have to eating shit? Yeah, great question. So, I mean, the, the addition of this mesh and really the sand, it's about a four, maybe a $2 fix. It's very, very cheap on what they're already putting in the ground. So, as far as the additional cost, very, very minimal. Um, and they probably already have a nest you know, kicking around their house in Bangladesh, and the sand is also widely available. Um, great question about the what the point is. Yeah. So in in areas of Bangladesh that I'm working, and when we can discuss what the best benefit is, what the most benefit is, and we can go into the, you know, the stats on that. But as we're trying to protect on multiple different levels, we're doing a two well project where we're, we're we've developed a low cost two well platform for about one-fifth of the cost of normal platforms. It's about a you know, $6 platform that they can put into their house really, really, really cost-effectively and, and very simply. So we're trying to protect the tube well from that perspective, but then also protecting what they're pulling from the ground. 
found. And that's where we see there's a lot of cross-contamination, 41% of two wells in some areas of Bangladesh are contaminated with fecal matter. And so if you think about people actually drinking their own, literally their own poop, because they're taking water from very close to the latrine. And so we're trying to find a way to decrease that cross-contamination between the two well water and the latrine. Does that answer your question? from India. My question is, what provisions have been made to have the toilet user friendly to sustain the uh, the accessibility to users? And is there any provision of uh, providing some lights to use the toilets in late evening or early in the morning? So we can reach there. Yeah, great question. So really we were just testing what was happening under the ground. We're using an existing toilet called the FFT, which is an IDE toilet, I believe. If you're familiar with um, the toilets that have been done by DE in Cambodia, it's, it's a similar version to that. Um, but we definitely, that's something we're, we're working on. We are developing kind of in tandem the superstructure, the substructure, and what we're calling the NIP structure or that user interface. And so this, this project is really focusing on the substructure. But yeah, great, I agree completely. I'm, I'm Mark Jesus of Duke University. I work with meshes in a very different context and intend to plug very quickly. Uh, I wanted to uh, hear your comments on the possibility of plugging over time. Absolutely, come find me afterwards, it'd be great. Yeah, I think the mesh, this mesh is really widely available in Bangladesh, but we're looking for ways to uh, increase the ability of this product to, to really work in different ways, so if we can find different types of mesh, that'd be great. Sure, but, but clogging, clogging of the mesh. Oh, clogging, I'm sorry. Yeah, so we, that's one thing we haven't done. Once these pits fill, um, we will be able to empty them. Uh, after a set amount of time, and then actually see what's happening. We don't know what's happening on the ground. That's great. I, I really think that that's something we need to work on. And hopefully, once we see if the pits are filling up, we've been testing to see if they fill up. The average household uses about 63 liters of water and sludge per day in Bangladesh. And so we we can we figure if it's filling up really quickly, we'll know it's clogging. And so far, we haven't had anything fill or spill yet. So. Um, yeah, the, the, the chaplain theory. Uh, I came across something else in, in India about the rats that were causing it. Was there, was there any evidence of rats uh, Yeah, not in this particular pit. I mean, definitely there were in other pits, but we did see the same channeling in those pits. We did see the rats in. So definitely something that I thought about. Um, it would be good to, to be able to dig these pits up and see. Um, like I said, it's just a theory right now, and because we want to continue testing, if we dig them up, then we can't continue the test. Um, so yeah, but I, yeah. If anyone has any experience with that, I'd love to hear. Um, I'm going to go there. 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 So even under the right conditions, that is something that you probably have to deal with, and it will happen, but it will happen in a longer time. Yeah, I think that's accurate. I think what we saw through the first uh, through the first nine years of the study is that we weren't really seeing any challenge because we were getting 100% bacteria removal. But we want to continue to test and see if that really is happening during the dry season, like I say. So, okay, last question from George. Hi, uh, George Michael from Wasa. Um, interesting presentation, very nice. Uh, I just have a question about your control. I'm wondering if you have is white white down to zero. If I was just correct. Yeah, that's a great question. So I think in one of my slides, I don't want to pull it up because I know we're rushed to time. Um, the control pit was not sealed. And so I actually think what was happening is you were getting uh, leakage of the fecal matter out through the, the seams between the rings, um, like you would expect. And so my other thought is that perhaps it was being, you know, the solution to pollution is dilution. So as the monsoon came in, it was like we actually removed a lot of the, the matter from the bottom of the pit, and then there might have been a layer, a, you know, a harder layer, and bring the layer of sludge formed, and then you're getting spillage through the gaps. That's my only theory right now, but if you have any other ideas, I'd love to hear. Okay, well, thank you very much. It was really interesting. And thanks for all your questions. And Who have papers at this conference? If you want to submit the 
article to the journal. Uh, it's called the IWA Wash Development Journal that you're supposed to send send it in before the end of the conference. I was told to the conference organizers. Or there's an email address probably on the website. Um, so don't forget to do that. Then the next presenter is Jing Ling. Jing is from China. Um, he, his company is called Beijing Sunny Breeze Technology. Um, his background is in the nuclear waste disposal. He said it's basically the same thing as people <laughs> much um, He's been um, he was a visiting scholar at New York University for five years, and um, he's, he's also an engineer, an elect uh, electrical engineer, and he's got a PhD in geoscience. So, um, Take a note like the 
over enough press to the full holes. That's the first reason. The second reason is most applications only like the uh, spot and the dirty and small part. So we only use one flashing hose that can save flashing water. Uh, the second part is black water tank. Why we need black water tank? Because in the rainy days, black water storage is much easier and uh, reliable than use the electricity to store uh, solar to store solar electricity. Now the hard part, on-site human waste processors. There are many challenges for design on-site human waste processors. But I think the most challenge, most hard part is the first is energy. The first is energy imbalance. The second hard part is the system is really easy to plan. <coughs> Folks, I'm sharing one. When you use the solar offer the electricity for power, it's very limited. But evaporation in a lot of energy is high energy consumption. To balance the energy the solution, first the solution is we just call minimum flushing coil, limited amount of the black water, but that's not enough because we cannot limit the P multiplication. So the second idea is MVR evaporator. What is MVR evaporator? First. The common evaporation includes three parts, vapor, evaporator, and the heating source. So MVR, MVR means mechanical vapor recompression. Use MVR. The vapor is, is collected and pushed to the mechanical compression. The vapor was compressed by the compressor, and the uh, distilled water was, was condemned, and the inside inner heat of the vapor was released. This inner heat this inner heat used to Source. So, so, the heat, heating source from the from the river is that uh, the previously heating source they offer the hot energy so this system saves a lot of energy generally speaking MVR technology can save more than 90% by energy MVR is not new technology it's over 50 years but most used in the heavy industries. Uh, for example, in the like the uh, distillation uh, plant, get the fresh water from the sea. Our job is to develop a low cost, family scale, uh, small size, and we are human based process last year. The most hard part here is we cannot find the correct uh, compressor. The technical compressor is industry and for the industry and we are, but they don't have there's no <coughs> proper compressor in the market. Uh, so we brought a 
about different small size uh, compressor, and uh, we try to refit and uh, refit review it. And uh, very lucky we, we success on this and uh, build a small uh, small NVR compressor. That's about two hundred dollars and uh, <coughs> about seven new, uh, about eight watts and light weight. <coughs> the second chain is clever. You may have this experience. Your candle indication is really easy to like the scale or first that use the clean water. So you can met use the like the black water or rose gold. The system will be very quickly to to stop work. So without proper measures, the system cannot work. The simple idea is school and ball system. We put some balls in the in the boilers. The ball, the boilers. We we do this. So the, use use this kind of thing make the system self clean. We tried a different way to build NVR processors.
So I, I won't take any questions now. But the good news is that he has written on the Susanna discussion forum about his process, and people have asked him questions there. You are very welcome to go there and check what has been asked already. And um, I can understand it all. So I can also go back and read more about it. But very interesting process. Thank you. Person who's not in the program, who is now going to present, um, he's called Tesra Magambo. He was in the program for one day. Um, he's from Tanzania, where he works for the Center for Community Initiatives. Um, sorry, I don't have your bio in front of me, but um, I don't know, are you an engineer as well? Oh, okay, sorry, we've got a session full of engineers here. And this presentation is about people's search management in informal settlements in urban Tanzania. So, 
speaking of the restaurant, which is the major city of Tanzania, uh, with a population of around 4 million people, about 7% live in informal settlements, where they lack uh, infrastructure, they lack post-cycle uh, uh, services, and so on. So uh, the communities have been using alternative means. So if, if they don't have uh, if they have this infrastructure of people's garden management, then they go to alternative means. So they've been opening up the toilets, being great, and flush the waste with it. Um, they've been flushing uh, the waste like the water sources. They've been digging up pits and buying the sludge as a solution. So, um, and those who can afford, who can access, who have access to roads, I think those who live not who live in the informal settlements, then they can afford the trucks, the, the parking trucks, which are cost at least 57 up to 1 to 2 USD. And, and people living in the informal settlement, they can't afford it. So, this is the situation now. You see an old man thinking, on, okay, my toilet is now full, the big is full, what should I do? He didn't have a defeat and then buy the start. You see the situation in most places uh, in the area. So, um, it, uh, a good for machine was invented. At first it started as a research and then it became a program. So, Facebook uh, water in Tanzania, it was not a program and then with other stakeholders they started a group of projects. So, the group uh, now, in this particular case, uh, started in 2010 with one settlement, which now we have set up to five more settlements. So, um, the group itself uh, is, uh, is a composed of the cycle that can at least trespass with the former settlements and, and, and a hand pump, uh, a hand pump that is pumped manually and a container uh, of, of around uh, 350, uh, 350 liters. So they, they came up, uh, they, they come to your house, they pump your pieces, and then they transport it to the ponds, which are a uh, big distance, at least 20, 40 kilometers. So the challenge had been the distance covered, and with the logistics of the rest of them, uh, I operated a lot of times. So uh, it was a challenge. The distance that was being covered by this group of operators was huge. So people started thinking about having decentralized for sort of treatment systems. Um, so they said, okay, why should we have a decentralized for sort of treatment system to solve this time? It was designed by Boulder. So now they have a decentralized for sort of treatment system at uh, site which they can get biofax out of it, and then they can get manure and then earth when the wheat can be used uh, to soil, uh, to condition the soil. So the, the cost of PKP is at least 15 to 24 USD, uh, but 35 meters a day, with, with that type of quality of feet, one thing is 5 meters. So this depends on the toilet, the depth of the toilet, and but again, it allows for speed. For those who cannot afford, then they can negotiate. Or, okay, if, if, if you cannot afford, you can do uh, it, then you can do part of it with the amount of money you have. So, this is the actual process. So, okay, with the pitch empty, the group, we are first to deal with the solid waste because um, pits in the former settlements, in most cases, uh, you will find that we use it. Uh, not only as a bit of a tree, but also a dustbin. It's where they, they, they throw everything, they throw pieces of papers, they throw pieces of coat. So it's hard for group of pump to work. So you have to deal with, uh, with solid waste, and then you do the actual pumping, you fill your tray, and then you go to the dumping station. So uh, the thing has an element of business. It has an element of business in it. And this is an example of an, uh, a monthly report from Mao that I collected from Mao. Uh, they have the, uh, the income, the income generated in a month is at least uh, a thousand USD. When you start to take down all the operations, you can see the motorbikes, the 
communications, disinfectants, then they, they have at least a profit of uh, about 500 USD a month, which is not, which is not bad. <coughs> so, uh, we say that the DWAT, the Supervisor Smaller Business System, has helped to improve uh, the, the group uh, business uh, by increasing the market niche. Previously, we used to sell only four, 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 four trips, and now we're selling up eight trips a day. And also, uh, as it is the annual revenue, at least we used to collect previously uh, about uh, 1,200 USD, but now they're collecting up to 4,000 4, USD. That is the time between 2013 and 2014. Uh, it has improved the sales, sales delivered by Rupa. Now they, they, they are proud now, they, they can even uh, take more the course now, okay, you can provide service at any time, so uh, of course that is a big high source, they are making more money. But then if you can cut down the cost of operations, the cost uh, has been reduced due to, to the distance, the cost that was cost by distance cover has been reduced from uh, 300 SP to 30 SP per month. It has increased the population of Rupa, now Rupa is well known. All over Tanzania, and like in every single, every single one is not because of the surprise of the city. So, uh, on scaling up now, uh, we are looking to involve more the government uh, through expertise because we use the resources we, we have some expertise from the government and through education and promotion. But then uh, there is an increase, increased interest uh, with sanitation stakeholders. Uh, for example, JZ and Boda are now willing to invest in the group. Uh, but the five institutions are now interested, according to the recent research, like they bought a few micro financial institutions, they're interested in putting in money to do this business. And the organization now, CCI has secured funds to scale up and move to two more settlements. But this is not enough, but it's enough for, to, to lobby in the government and try to scale up. And then there is a little high community for the life. Yes, we say that uh, Umawa group uh, is a success story, but then we, we, we realize that we agree that well, uh, not so much, it's not so much owned by the community because uh, it is like uh, one group driving everything. So we need more, I mean, everyone is going to understand and drive the project. But then there is I need to look for other product solutions uh, relating to people's life. Example, uh, we have started uh, a small project of simplified sewage. A small project of simplified sewage, uh, where we are starting with 20 houses to see in the US. And this project now involves, uh, involves a lot of stakeholders, it involves the government, it involves the utilities, and, and the community of life. The challenges of Picketing, as usual, uh, picketing uh, things are full of solid waste. So you have big pieces of solid waste, and then they will be with the people's time. And then the long distance travel to dumping sites, 80 to 40 kilometers, high demand of the sectors, especially in the water, in the mall. But then uh, lack of food financing mechanism, where uh, they already exist in Newton. But then we say it's not financing and investing, but not so many as financing. It's those many funds that were a part of the research. And the challenge of the group at Tiwa's model, it has been the variation in the, in the effort. This is an example of a uh, percentage removal of people, people, uh, people call it that was started. As you see, it varies, it varies. Sometimes it drops to at uh, 38 percent. So there should be some, some improvement. So what is what? Studies have been undertaken on how to, to uh, improve group what are you working with CEO and other universities uh, at the local context? They are looking into moving from money to modernizing. Uh, and good quality of the Tiwa test points, but they are now constructing a stand feature to make sure that they are part of the test points. Increased number of business in the previous, interest in PTMT, so we are promoting and, uh, and mobilizing the increased number of people interested. So I think it's a set of things like the network is a group and do what is possible. I need to involve more community 
Thank you very much.